you know, our next talk is uh, from Dr. Uh, Mike, Professor Mike Fiddy, um, who was a, a DARPA PM and started the Quest program, I guess, before he left and uh, is now working uh, with the Army, uh, in addition to his professor role at the uh, University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Uh, I think he's an expert in nonlinear systems and nonlinear optics. Uh, but you're going to talk to us today about wave interactions with hard and soft resonance structures, which I think may include uh, biological systems as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not so great at introductions, but... Uh, <laughs> that's fine, that's good. Can you, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you great. Good. Um, yeah, well, thanks, uh, Charles, for the introduction and the opportunity to participate again. This, this is a, a great meeting for stimulating thoughts. Um, and some of the comments made yesterday, um, I think relate to what I have to say here in, in that uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk primarily about classical physics models for electromagnetic wave interactions and look at how we can push them further or if we can push them further at all. Um, so it's asking questions in, in the Feynman sense, not that I think that can't be answered, but that we perhaps just haven't answered yet, <laughs> but might still be able to, and give us that deeper understanding. Um, so since leaving DARPA, I've, I've kept a strong interest in the propulsion and quest related topics, but I had a program there called radio bio and, and the low frequency electromagnetic wave matter interaction program. And my work with the army is, has really um, focused more on that, um, interactions with biological materials. I'm, I'm gonna conflate the two in this talk because I see some knowledge gaps that might be relevant to both. Excuse me, are we recording? Um, if you would like to record, do. Yes, we're recording, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk uh, a bit about wave interactions with, with high Q resonance structures and, and start off talking a bit about the M drive again. Um, but then, then talk more about metastructures and coupled elements and more stochastic resonances in materials and think about the, the forces in these structures and the non-linearities of these interactions and the possibility of entrainment in dynamic structures, which has more relevance to, say, acoustic metamaterials and biological materials. And then an, an area of, of um, I think, interest um, to many of us is when, when we look at these structures, not with continuous wave, but pulsed waves, pulses, and think about whether <coughs> some of the observations and ideas uh, out there are, are accurate in interpreting how pulsed interactions interact with these materials, um, both hard and soft. And I feel uh, I saw this, this cartoon last, um, <laughs> last week, um, and I, I feel it's it, it epitomizes this talk to some extent. It, mean, it means uh, no disrespect to CDC, but I, I feel we have a lot of bits of information and ideas out there which are not still well connected to give us a clear picture of, of the situation when it comes to electromagnetic wave interactions. Um, so I, my apologies to the artist, but this, this I think symbolizes um, the talk going forward. Um, I, I've talked about M drives in the last couple of meetings and, and a year ago um, we, we reviewed some of these structures and the dilemma facing, um, facing people in understanding you know, can they work or not given different analyses of their um, function in terms of being resonant cavities and interpreting what that means, either in terms of photons or classical electromagnetic waves or quantum quantized inertia models 
is, is there a, a mechanism for movement of these structures? And if, if so, is it in any way um, defeating or con contradicting some of our closely held laws? Um, Newton's third law, uh, which was, was restated recently in a physics education article, I, I came across um, put, was put this way that while two bodies interact dynamically, they simultaneously exert equal and opposite force upon each other. And, and the other law that um, has, has been used as a criticism of these cavity based propellantless thrusters is conservation of energy. And I want to briefly touch on, on both of these. Um, and I'll tell you now, I ha still have more questions than answers. So um, this is just how it seems to be with this, this can of worms. Um, so I also showed this slide with, with the many different models out there, which all, all focus around a similar high Q cavity structure, but have very different interpretations associated with them as to how they might work and, and there, there are probably many more so apologies if I've, I've left any anyone off here um, but clearly it's a big deal it, it was important in in DARPA to look into this as, as you heard from Dave Lewis anticipating surprise is one of DARPA's key mission focuses and if we are missing some physics which might explain the ability to provide thrust even you know, tens of millinewtons per kilowatt, kilowatt, it could really be a game changer in terms of, for example, moving satellites around in, in, in space. It would be a huge game changer. So when we look at some of the papers discussing this topic, and I, I'm going back to Roger Scheuer, who, who really started this uh, 20 years ago, um, his way of thinking about these cavities is in terms of a very classical microwave model, um, actually based on papers by a, a former boss of mine when I was in London, um, Alec Cullen, who, who was measuring radiation uh, power from a Lorentz force on the detector. And, and so Scheuer has built uh, a, a fairly simple theory um, for a thruster based on these classical principles. His expression for the thrust, if you can see my cursor is up on the top right there. Um, and the important thing is that it's, it's a function of the Q of the cavity. And of course, <laughs> the Q is something which in a real cavity that you're pumping microwaves into or light uh, is, is going to expand, it's going to have some losses and some heating and actually maintaining a high Q in a particular mode is not an easy task. But Scheuer, to be fair to him, has, has consistently argued this should work. He claims to have um, demonstrated it, but these results have not been reproduced. Um, but his Q is, is huge, it's, it's 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 8. And um, he very um, willingly will look at people's designs, their cavity shapes, and the modes they may be launching and the stability of those cavities and point out that you know, in most cases the cues are just too small for any useful thrust to arise if indeed this model, this way of thinking is correct. And I'm not saying it is, but it's a, a fair criticism that the cues are not as high as the ones he, he would like to see or expects for this to work. Um, and more importantly, and this gets me into pulses, is that in looking at conservation of energy in these systems, uh, he's carefully thought through how the thrust will decrease with time as energy is transferred from inside the cavity to kinetic energy. And, and so you know, if you're moving a large mass, the acceleration might be quite small anyway, but it's going to go to zero fairly quickly, um, which is why he's, he suggests pulsing the system and maintaining a kind of steady burst of energy to maintain 
uh, a velocity using this system. So pulsing um, is, is, is where is my lead in to uh, the, really the rest of the, the talk. <laughs> um, if we think about these cavities, these structures, um, and, and try to break down how they're made, what they're made from, um, a, a number of questions pop out that are not easy to answer. Right? One, for example, is these are metal cavities. So there's a classical skin depth associated with them, which is based on a simple oscillator model for the physical interaction. And it's a skin depth estimate, which is assuming uh, an infinitely um, an infinite half space of a homogeneous medium with a certain conductivity. And of course, the actual cavity <laughs> with a, a, a high Q mode oscillating in it uh, has, has many corners, um, rivets, features associated with it, um, which, which make one question whether the skin depth estimates and the leakage out of the cavity, and that in fact it's assumed Q, uh, in practice, what the theory might might suggest are needed, and and interesting recent papers by um, Stefan Mayer and others have shown oh, you you can play with the skin depth with structures on the surface um, by essentially creating little resonators, and of course the shape of the structure matters, and, and we ourselves have done some experiments showing um, resonant penetration into metal cylinders, uh, notably beer cans in, in our case, um, and showing that you, you can build up high field strengths in a metal cavity, even when its thickness is many skin depths based on this, this formula. Um, I won't dwell on these, you can look at the slides later, but the, the idea of structuring the conductivity of a material by applying structures almost gets you into the field of metamaterials immediately and how these pattern structures affect the skin depth and the effective cue of the system. Um, you know, it's, we're starting to get a handle on, on understanding that. And, and this very nice paper by Mayer's group, it, it helps one understand a bit about how um, distributions of metals, if you have um, nanostructures made of metal, then appropriate use of um, bias fields, which may actually be fields present in an extremely high Q cavity, can shift electrons around and change the properties of the bulk material. Um, if, if one's prepared to look at, a, at, a, at a, a, a structured form for these materials, which may or may not be induced by a very high field in the neighborhood of the metal. Um, so these ideas are being fleshed out and it, the bottom line is, it, it, I think there's a lot still to be understood about skin depth and structure and penetration and what Q really means. And I think this is particularly true if we're gonna talk about pulsing the system. Um, <laughs> the re this recent paper by by um, Pendry, um, Yang et al. tries to think about structure more as a continuum of possible effective values for a material, depending on how the component parts conductivity may be controllable. So another way of saying that is that if we have a way of structuring a material's uh, conductivity, for example, then we can constructively control its effective electromagnetic properties. And in, in, in the presence of, of strong coupling and strong nonlinearity, uh, I guess what I'm suggesting is, do we really understand our capabilities in changing the effective properties of materials? Um, <laughs> Uh, you all know the equation for skin depth, and if we turn to biological materials for a minute, then the assumption is that at low frequencies, uh, there's a lot of conductivity in tissue. Um, as you go to higher frequencies, 
high mega, hundreds of megahertz to gigahertz, you tend to be interacting more with the water content of the body um, and heating occurs and there's less penetration. <laughs> and we've all seen figures like this one, which is a plot of penetration depth in tissue as a function of frequency and it falls off fairly rapidly. Um, but these, again, these are estimates based on um, this formula we saw before for the skin depth. They're reasonable estimates, um, but they're also estimates that are tied to um, specific frequencies. And they don't include what may happen in terms of a light matter interaction with a pulse. And they certainly ignore the fact that <laughs> curvature plays a role, as I mentioned, with the beer cans. And this is something that's um, still very much classical in nature, but not a topic that has been widely explored. Um, maybe in the plasmonics field, there's more that's been done to try and understand whether the term skin depth really even has any meaning when you have structures with curvature and features that are on the order of the wavelength or smaller. Um, and when we think about the classical picture for what causes uh, a skin depth estimate for a given material, uh, it's, it's clear that structure can mess this up because we tend to think about skin depth as a, a pushing of the electrons towards the edge, basically by self-induced eddy currents or fields in the material. Um, <coughs> which increase at higher frequencies. So if you interrupt those current loops that can generate, be generated by an incident field in a conducting material, if you can interrupt the path of those loops, then you're going to inherently alter the, the skin depth that you expect to happen with that, to have, that you expect to have for that material. Um, so no, a number of papers have, have looked at this, but I'd say there are still a lot of knowledge gaps to um, dig more deeply into um, and understand skin depth effects. Uh, a very nice paper <laughs> this year uh, by Zubin Jacob and, and colleagues shows how one can literally use structure to control skin depth. Um, by putting um, features on the surface of an existing body, um, which, which help manage those eddy currents and thereby increase the way in which radiation can penetrate the, the effective skin depth, which you see on the, um, time. on the right, which can either increase or decrease based on structure. Um, I'm going to, I keep hammering on about structure because I think it's very important that we not forget the role of structure in electromagnetic interactions. Um, that's an obvious thing to say, but it often is uh, not, not, not taken as, as seriously as I believe it should. But let me go back to the M drive for a moment. <laughs> I, I mentioned this paper, I think last year, and I'm not going to dwell on it for long, but it's important, I believe, because it is an attempt to understand what inertia really means, but it's done so in terms of an electromagnetic cavity. Some of you are probably familiar with this older paper. Um, <laughs> and I think again, as, as we did at the beginning of the talk about radiation trapped between two conducting sheets, um, there's a radiation force on the boundary and the, the CW wave now they're thinking about in terms of creating a pulsation <laughs> on those conducting surfaces. Um, and <laughs> that pulsation can move, uh, imp impose a force that can move one of those conducting sheets through radiation pressure if it's free to move. Um, what this analysis does, and this, this um, uh, takes me back to something that, that Roger Scheuer told me with the M drive and seemed um, almost hilarious at the time, but uh, I, I think he really meant it, is you've got to give the M drive a push to get started. And this whole analysis in the 
Jenison paper <laughs> is um, based on giving it a push to get started. Um, a small incremental velocity in one direction upsets the balance of the forces that occurs between those plates with the reflecting electromagnetic wave in between them. <laughs> and um, the analysis is, is based on um, an increment of time determined by the transmission, the propagation time between the two metal sheets. So it's an expression for force that can be written as a sort of differential. <laughs> and in their paper, they indicate the effect of this as a set of incremental uh, forces in one direction. It's a very elegant paper and interesting analysis, but it sort of begs the question, going all the way back to Scheuer advocating pulses, that well, what if, what if you do introduce pulses? What if you have a high Q, which is a more complicated concept with pulses because of the broad bandwidth, but um, is this incremental pushing <laughs> of a surface, perhaps from pulses, uh, a, a, a clue to part of the mechanism that's required for sustained thrust from one of these cavities. So in, in the Jenison paper, you can, you can um, see they consider these two freely moving um, conducting sheets that are now uh, phase locked together once you give one a push by the difference in forces seen as one is pushed in one direction and the other has to follow. It's, it's a very interesting idea to keep in mind. So let, let me broaden this out now to um, pulses in general and what kind of pulses are out there. And we all know from um, our basic physics, and this came up in the last talk from uh, Dr. Solomon, that you're, you're, you're accelerating a charge ultimately to create the possibility of a radiating field to transfer energy from that wire into space. <clears throat> the acceleration part is important. A charge traveling at constant velocity <laughs> will not radiate, but it will go through phases of constant velocity as you accelerate it up and down. And that constant velocity will give rise still to a field as energy associated with it. But when you decompose what's happening from the wire and you stick a reflector behind it, you've got a near field, you've got a, a, this sort of quasi-static field, which is of the order of the wavelength in, in distance from, from the antenna. You've got a, a region in which you have propagating, but it's a, a, a Fresnel radiating region. And then you've got the far field, which we all know and love and can describe by Fourier analysis. And um, what's very interesting is in this radiative um, region um, between far field and, and, and reactive non-radiative, you, you have characteristics of propagation that if you're pulsing do determine the losses and the degree of collimation of the beam in that region. Um, this has been known for 20 plus years. Some of you may have come across IRAs or impulse radiating antennas um, or lo localized wave antennas, which rely on the pulse width as um, a, a parameter to help direct a beam further before you hit that far field diffractive like divergence from the antenna. And I, I stress you need a pulse, a pulser and a fast switch for this to really be significant and this rise time to be sufficiently small that you push that, <laughs> that um, collimated region in the Fresnel zone uh, further and further out. Uh, in principle, if you had a unipolar pulse, which is impossible, apparently to create uh, as a propagating wave, um, this Fresnel region with extremely, you know, infinitely fast rise time pulse would, would go out to infinity. Um, 
So let's think about pulses and let's think about how they might interact with materials. Um, we, we know that they transport energy. We know the time average pointing vector gives us a um, measure of the intensity. And that um, electromagnetic energy density carries with it momentum, as we've just said, in pushing those, those conducting plates, for example. Um, in, in this very nice older paper by um, Gordon in, in 73, um, he thinks about pulses and he thinks about how the momentum density of the electromagnetic field relates to the pointing vector, um, which is a very simple expression up here. The important thing is the realization that the mechanical momentum of the atoms in the pulse is proportional to the um, index of the material. And, and this, was, this was further round home to us in a paper by um, Joins at um, Duke University back in 81, <laughs> that whenever you have uh, electromagnetic fields at boundaries, uh, the, the force at those boundaries is always directed across the interface from the high permittivity to the low permittivity region, um, regardless of the field polarity. Um, this is, I think, an important and interesting point to remember. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I see um, Dr. Solomon, you have your hand up. Um, I only just noticed because I'm hiding this. D did you have a question now or would you, do you want me to keep going? Well, it was very quick, and that was what your concept of, in terms of overcoming the electromagnetic inversion, uh, inertia rather, when you use that nice elegant term of the balanced of, of balanced forces. But when you have balanced forces, you have to do something to overcome the inertia with this push. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts or insights about that. Um, that's, that's a great question. I I am um, I feel like. Um, somewhat like a forensic researcher here in that a lot of these older papers have interesting comments like that. And I feel some of the authors understood the fundamentals a lot better than I do and maybe many of us do today. So the, the idea in Jenison's paper of giving it a push to get things going to in, induce an imbalance which can then feed on itself intuitively makes some sense to me, although initially it, it seemed wrong. It seemed almost like cheating, but um, thinking, trying to think more deeply about the complexity of what's going on here with potentially a high Q resonator and the forces on the surface of that resonator and the fact that it is a it, whatever the skin depth is, there's never 100% uh, attenuation of the field. And it may be that there's more penetration than one would think, um, given these nuances in estimating skin depth. Um, then giving something a push in one direction all of a sudden makes some sense to me. But I don't, I'm not. I, 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 I go back to that Rubik's Cube. These are bits of information which I'm still not sure I'm assembling correctly, but I think they're important um, pieces of a bigger picture that needs to be assembled. Uh, two quick comments on that uh, that relate to Charles. Uh, Charles and I have a common love for inertia and momentum and its representations in all other things other than just mechanical and the mystery of it. Uh, a few years ago, I completely showed that the, the mock concept of the stars uh, uh, accounting for inertia is absolutely ridiculous, uh, back of the envelope calculation. But at any rate, this also though relates, so that's one concept. That's why, you know, it's to me important that I know to Charles it's important. But also in, in relationship to what you just said about these authors, I think many of them are dead. Uh, in relationship to Charles's information thing that he wants to do with the AI. One of the things that I used to speak to Kurzweil about 
was the notion of finding everything that a scientist wrote, everything, and then finding some mechanism. What that scientist is doing is he's using words and text to describe an, a complex connected image inside their brain. And if you could go and somehow process everything that they ever wrote, you might find that inherent in it, you could withdraw insights that they wouldn't have. I've many times spoken to an author and said, it's remarkable you just said this. And he said, what do you mean? I never said it. And I said, yeah, on page 12, you said that. And page 95, you said that. And page 267, you said that. And I put it together and he said, oh yeah, I did say that. So I'm just saying that there is some hope possibly using advanced textual processing, information processing to get to what you're hinting at very nicely, Mike, which is these folks had an understanding, which may not have been uh, directly expressed in a particular paper of things that we certainly need today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, well, thanks for that comment. I, I think we all struggle to communicate clearly, and it is a function of the words we have available to us and, and how we use them. And of course, what those words mean to the person on the receiving end and um, our interpretation, there's, a, there's always a bias to how we interpret what we hear. But um, just to pick up on, on, on your point, the, the you know, DARPA has run programs looking, for example, at all the past papers on how certain chemicals were made. And there may be three or 400 different methods proposed to make one particular chemical. And using AI to distill from all of these different methods, what, is the, what are the key steps that are really needed to achieve production of that chemical cheaply, quickly, um, efficiently, uh, can come out of an analysis like this. And, and so to your point, thinking about how authors in an age when they weren't driven by page charges and page lengths, and perhaps um, it did express themselves very carefully and more fully, but we're not reading into it what they really meant, does seem worth doing. Um, because I, I also think there was a greater intuition especially with regard to some of these physical concepts back then, which we've now labeled and use and perhaps build on um, forgetting their origins. Um, anyway, th th thank you for that. Th let me, let me um, keep going because I know the clock is ticking and I've got a few more things I wanted to say. What, one is going back to pulses. Um, Leo Falson and, and colleagues way back noted the fact which you can see in these two plots, that um, pulses penetrate materials more deeply. And this may be obvious when we think about, say, a high Q system and how the energy stored <laughs> and the energy that leaks out of it is still a reciprocal system. And so if we understand how the energy leaks out, we would expect if we reinsert energy in that temporal way in that waveform that it would entirely be absorbed and, and looking at the left here with cw gigahertz uh, illumination of a lossy dielectric um, the <laughs> depth of penetration uh, is x um, if we ping it with a pulse then the penetration is a lot greater and by changing the pulse shape one can control the penetration depth. And I, I think this is a very interesting and important idea. And I, I want to connect it to this, this next slide where have, having a background in, in looking at specific structures and metamaterials, uh, even before DARPA, thinking about any shape as an antenna or as an abstracted circuit of some kind, um, like this split ring resonator on the left, um, we can define a number of resonant frequencies associated with most shapes that will have a Q, and the Q we can describe in various ways, including the one I just mentioned, energy stored over energy dissipated per cycle. But what's interesting is <laughs> when we think about either nonlinear effects at very high field strengths, or maybe structures which are um, soft in the sense that you can stress them, impose strains on them, you can change their shape. 
and th this animation on the right from David Smith illustrates this very well, that even a split ring resonator, if you allow it to change its shape in quite subtle ways, um, will shift its resonant frequency quite a bit. Um, but the reciprocal case is true as well, I think, in that if I have a soft matter structure and I drive it at a certain frequency close to resonance, it's quite likely to distort and store energy um, at that frequency, change its shape until it's tuned to that resonant frequency. And th this is very important um, if we start thinking about nonlinear effects or soft matter structures. Um, I've always liked this slide from a, an old metamaterial paper just showing how you know, an individual split ring will have certain resonances as you pack them together and build a material from them. We're going to introduce coupling between the elements. The resonances will change, they'll shift. Uh, eventually you'll end up with a band structure from these elements. But if each of these can be entrained or change its shape, change its resonance when it's illuminated by frequencies close to its, uh, one of its resonances, then you know, it's interesting to think about what the whole structure might do and how the whole structure might morph to track resonant frequencies um, or, or track incident frequencies that they can adapt to be close to a resonance. So this, this um, idea of entrainment from a physical point of view allows one to open an enormous space of creating structures that are somewhat conducting in a background host, may or may not be a lossy dielectric of some kind. But now we, we can think about material properties um, which can incorporate most of the known physical phenomena. We could have piezo um, properties in there, just as in um, many biological structures, uh, a lot of ion channels and membrane structures are piezoelectric. So these are structures that uh, pressure will change the voltage on them, the voltage will change their dimensions, an external field can in principle um, couple into them and organize their shape and their behavior. So um, just as we know we can do this and create coherent effects consciously, on the macroscopic scale, we also know that we can do this on the biological scale as well. Um, early papers on pacemakers, for example, recognize that um, if, if you create a voltage source locally in biological material with a periodicity that's you know, a, little, perhaps a little faster, a little higher frequency than the natural period of the structure, maybe a heart or a muscle, then you can entrain it. You can, um, you can um, phase lock it, for want of a better term, um, uh, to keep it um, functioning appropriately. Um, so this leads me to the last couple of slides. And um, we, we know about um, mechanical instabilities arising from mechanical pulses. And I want to draw an analogy with electromagnetic pulses and electromagnetic structures, in particular soft matter ones. Um, the entrainment I was just talking about was well illustrated, uh, has been over the centuries by um, you know, people marching in step, like the, the previous um, army I showed a movie of, on bridges and the bridges have natural frequencies. Um, you can couple the, 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 the marching period into one of those resonant frequencies and get the um, bridge swaying, uh, uh, absorbing energy and moving uh, to the point where you can destroy the bridge. Some were destroyed by resonances from wind. Some just swung around a lot because of people marching on them. And there's, there's a sort of theory for this, um, for biological oscillators, 
which takes into account the um, resonant frequencies of the structure, um, the period of the pulsing, the pulsation, um, and uh, also important is the pulse waveform itself. And, and some critical threshold can be passed at which you can expect entrainment to occur. And that entrainment <laughs> could phase lock the entire system. Uh, it could go further and create chaos in the system. So it's a sort of subtle effect where there may be windows of appropriate amplitude or let's say field strength um, pulse waveform, pulse repetition rate, for which certain systems are more responsive than, than others. Um, sorry for the quality of the text on this, but um, what you see <laughs> happening, and it, it takes me back to the Jenison paper, <clears throat> is that as, as you increase the number of pulses over time, or you increase the number of people um, walking on the bridge, then you get this um, similar ladder-like effect and an, an effective, if you think of these as differentials, as, as an, an effective um, force being developed by those steps that can connect resonantly, couple strongly to the bridge. Um, a very recent paper um, <laughs> points out it's a little more complicated than the earlier one that um, that then analyze the Millennium Bridge and, and that there is the motion of the person not just stepping on the bridge, but the motion of their center of gravity as the bridge begins to sway, which can accentuate this effect. And the accentuation of the effect could simply lead to a more prominent um, motion at resonant frequencies of the bridge, or it could throw it into chaos. Um, and this is nicely analyzed in this paper as, as different numbers of people <laughs> at different uh, pace rates can induce different effects in a bridge. Um, so taking this to um, other analogies um, out there, worth, worth mentioning, um, we sometimes see um, rogue waves in the ocean and in systems, which are, are an unusual strong response, a sort of stochastic resonance, which can cause a lot of damage. And we, we're desperately trying to better understand how they occur in various systems. But I would argue that there's, it's a, it's a non-linear coupling phenomenon that is, is at the core of, of the, the, the creation of these waves. And very important as a, as a sort of general statement with any set of coupled nonlinear elements, um, one can expect threshold-like responses as we saw with the bridge, where beyond a certain field strength, for example, <laughs> whatever the seemingly random distribution of um, behaviors of the oscillators were up to that point, they will phase lock together. This, this idea of explosive synchronization um, has received quite a bit of attention in the last couple of years. Um, and it, it is of concern and of interest when it comes to uh, the cyclical processes in the body. Uh, I don't just mean alpha, beta, gamma waves in the brain, but there's the heart, there's the ATPA cycle that um, basically moves matter around in cells. There are a lot of cyclical behaviors, which from a very classical physics point of view, um, in principle could be coupled into with the appropriate field strengths and um, frequencies, which could be a pulse repetition rate. Um, and conversely, and this was part of what the radio bio program was about in, in at DARPA, was the, um, the converse can uh, occur too. When you have charged particles that are um, oscillating together, accelerating ions in a systematic way, then of course they're also going to radiate. And as a means of communication, 
which might be more efficient, more of a broadcast of information in the body, better than chemical signaling, which has a very limited range, maybe 70 um, microns or so at best, um, that as a communication method to help synchronize systems of systems within living organisms, um, these electromagnetic fields and these, I will say, pulse-like oscillations, uh, in particular in, in the head with neural spiking, um, begin to make some sense as a communication method um, internally, but also as a mechanism that perhaps externally we can understand can be affected by fields created outside of the body. Um, Dr. Solomon, you have another question, please. Uh, yes, I was wondering if via the DARPA program, the bio program and so on, you're aware of anybody who is doing this. I was working with a group at MIT and a few others. We were trying to go off and measure electromagnetic waves, photonic waves, uh, um, et cetera, coming off from uh, organelles, uh, intracellular, as well as intercellular. Certainly there's a tremendous amount of activity going on at fairly high rates, such as when you're transcribing or um, um, a protein. Yes. So my question is, are you aware of anybody who has actually measured uh, signals coming off at cellular levels uh, 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 on a biological basis. Yeah, yes, and, and there, there were several teams in that radio bio program, and I can give you more information about them off, offline, but one was University of Michigan, looking at biofilms, University of Central Florida, University of San Diego, uh, um, University of California, San Diego. Um, yeah, there were a number of teams that were able to measure um, emission. The, the task of the program was to come up with a, 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 a physical model that explained not only reception of certain frequencies in biology, the reception of signals, but understood a physical mechanism in biology that could also be responsible for transmitting. And the goal of the program was to show that there was transmit and receive in biological entities, uh, that, that nature didn't just receive, nature transmitted as well. And that's very hard, but a lot of progress was made in terms of developing models for different biosystems and converging them over time through the program, converging the predictions of the theoretical models with the um, capabilities in the lab of the, of the equipment to measure these fields. Um, so I, I think the program, uh, I, I've been gone over a year now and the program is, is coming to an end if it hasn't ended already. I don't know if a follow-on program will, will be created, but a lot of progress, I would say a lot of progress and understanding was, was made and, and it's certainly influenced um, my thinking in this talk, which I know has meandered from M drives to um, brain waves, but um, there's a thread here, if you think of my Rubik's cube, these are, these are connected ideas, at least in my, my head. So, so the last couple of slides, and then I know I'm, I'm out of time. Um, apart from um, the, the advances made in, in, in metamaterials over the last 20 years, in particular in the last um, 10 years, the electromagnetic properties of materials that you engineer the, the meta atoms for and you build and construct from these abstracted circuits to create materials with properties that you perhaps didn't have before, gives you new functionality. Um, this has given us a lot of insight too about how structures in all materials can uh, greatly affect the uh, electromagnetic properties, but also, of course, in acoustic metamaterials, the textures and the proximity of resonating elements and how they're coupled to each other can greatly affect the acoustic propagation of um, in those materials. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to point out a, a number, there have been a number of excellent reviews of 
um, I call soft matter or um, acoustic meta mechanical meta materials recently. And an important uh, point to make is that with the original work in, in meta materials, the hope was that with a very ordered pattern of elements like those split ring resonators, one could build a bulk material from them with very few defects. And because they're large on the scale of um, fabrication capabilities, at least for microwave metamaterials, one, one could pattern these with some precision and build defect free volumes where you get coherent effects between large numbers of them, which would lead to these very unusual properties. Um, interestingly, um, tolerances and fabrication errors don't give you quite the precision you would like. Um, and so it's often a smaller volume of the total bulk metamaterial that gives you the properties you're looking for. Um, but the nature of the disorder matters. And this was some very <laughs> nice work um, done at Northeastern showing, uh, and, and at other places, showing how certain degrees of disorder can still, can still sustain coherent properties when it comes to wave propagation through them. So while they may look disordered, um, the coupling properties between the right meta atoms in those patterns can still give you um, high Q, high field strengths, band gaps, and so on. And um, this paper and a recent one just out uh, this week in, in Nature Photonics shows that in all kinds of um, biological situations where you have apparent uh -huh. random, you can find stochastic resonances, but that nonlinearity I talked about can allow them to organize themselves and create larger Q resonating structures within them if that dynamism is possible, if they can move or there's a nonlinearity. Um, and you know, the, the, the role of pulses in all of this is that it gives you a degree of control if you understand rise times and relaxation times in how you can deliver and maybe lock with the pulse repetition rate these structures into a cooperative and oscillating and explosive oscillating state, as I described earlier. So, so with that, let, let me end. Um, we've gone from M drives to entrainment in soft matter structures, but um, I think uh, I, I've, I'm hoping I've probably raised more questions than answers in this talk. And this is the, um, the topic area that I think deserves um, more, more attention, entirely classical, and probably there's a lot actually in the literature, in the older literature, that can help inform us on this um, more than we've remembered or found so far. So that, let me end with that. And uh, in the last minute, if there's time for any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, appreciate your talk once again uh, this year. Um, so I, I had a question about the uh, rogue waves. Are you thinking that a rogue wave is responsible for um, the, the um, force in an EM drive? In other words, maybe there is a uh, rogue wave that happens and that's why you get a kick? Um, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm saying we can't rule it out. And similarly, with electromagnetic bio effects and given coupling phenomena that can occur, um, you know, a sudden short pain or a headache or something like that could be a rogue wave induced externally into a, a, bu a, a bunch of neurons. I yeah. don't know, but I don't see how we can rule that out without a deeper look. The physics yeah. seems to suggest these are possibilities. 
Yeah, Jim, in his talk about the uh, environment and the climate yesterday, emphasized rogue waves and uh, mm -hmm. the generation of rogue waves that are going to happen as as dragon kings in our environment. These you know these out out um, outliers. Yes. Uh, and there's been quite a few ships lost uh, that are attributed to rogue waves. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, there's a lot we don't understand, and it's all classical. I, I, I think you may have used the analogy some time ago of with the progression of time, uh, there's knowledge transverse to that direction. But if you map out knowledge as a function of time, it looks a bit like a Swiss cheese. And there are these holes you leave behind of areas where I guess the funding or the excitement, the um, sexiness of the topic didn't warrant any deeper look then. And people moved on but right right we still don't know yeah well, so an think... example of that is a is a is a victor tom and his whole issue of catastrophe theory and then mm -hmm. how politically politically and textbook wise you know the textbook wars that go on all the time at universities what do we teach what do we don't uh went ahead and got completely pushed into the chaos but if you go back to Victor Tom uh, and you go back to catastrophe theory and you go back to things, other things like one over F, then you're really hitting on some wonderful things that Mike taught me, because, uh, taught us because, uh, or talking about, because we're talking about whole areas of analytics and monitoring, which we can do nowadays on people and stop this nonsense epidemic of plumbing that kills hundreds of thousands every year in this country, uh, whether it's a heart attack or a stroke or uh, some other, um, uh, neural type of firing thing, all of stuff which is part, all part and parcel, perhaps, of this phenomenon. Yeah. I think uh, Lance raised his hand, has a question or comment. Hi, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, hi, Mike. Yeah, thanks for a really thoughtful and introspective talk. Uh, I had, you know, uh, one comment and then a question for you. I uh, so famously, Tesla had some sort of resonator that he claimed could shake a building. I don't know if you had seen that, but that might be uh, something to look at as well. I, I don't know quite how the feedback worked on that, but it might be one more data point for your, your giant toolbox of data points on this topic. The, yeah. the Tibetans also had this thing about sound. They could levitate things. And there's some Englishman that was there, I think in the last century, he saw this effect but it seems like to me maybe this rogue wave phenomena is more general i don't know if mike might if i could ask you a question but this nonlinear schrodinger equation that's where the, this guy did um an analysis and he found like the road rogue wave in the ocean could be modeled by this nonlinear schrodinger equation which i am completely I've no clue about, I wonder if you could comment on it. I, I'd like to, uh, I just want to finish my question if I could. Yeah. That, and I'll turn it over. Uh, so Mike, uh, regarding the M drive, uh, I think uh, experimentally, and perhaps people like Martin Timar could speak more to it, but it appears that it's never been shown to produce thrust, uh, if I'm correct. But yet, uh, in your talk, I, I hear that you believe it is plausible somehow. So could you just comment, uh, you know, do you believe there is some plausible mechanism and therefore uh, our experimental technique is not uh, somehow not seeing it? Or, or can you reconcile, you know, the, this apparent contradiction? And, and that ends my question. Yeah, okay, Lance, no, that's a fair question. Then I'll get back to Jim, but um, I, th I the, the, the people who built these M drives are not stupid people. Um, and a number have reported some thrust. Now, of course, it could be due to coupling with the vacuum chamber or with power lines in the room nearby. There, there's so many complicated scenarios that could lead to a force that might appear to show the system move that experiments are difficult because of the coupling issues. But I still would, I, I don't think 
I'm ready to write it off completely yet because it's one of those one of those things that a, a few people claim to have seen this. I don't believe they're that they're. I, I, let's say I, I I accept they saw something. Can we explain it? Now either the system does exhibit some thrust, or some of the subtle physical effects I talked about may help explain why there was more coupling or interaction with other objects in the lab that explained the movement they saw. But I, th I think it provides a good vehicle in many ways to dig more deeply into the fundamental physics of what's going on here. Um, in a, in a, in a, and, and let's see, let's, let's, I, I just don't want to write it off immediately. That, that's, I don't want to write it off yet. Um, the fact it's so hard to reproduce, I mean, thinking about bioeffects, if you remember a study done, I think by the National Academies a few years ago, of research funded by NIH, how something like 75% of all the research funded by and reported um, by NIH could not be reproduced. The lack of reproducibility to me just means we haven't got our arms around all the variables yet. We don't really understand what we're doing. It doesn't mean, you know, lack of reproducibility is not lack of evidence that the effect occurs. Yeah. It might be interesting if there was some impact of the intent of the experimenter on the operation, the physical operation of the device like George Hathaway had seen in uh, mm -hmm. some of the things that he's um, <laughs> viewed in the past. I know that's kind of an outlandish statement, but. No, but some experiments are just very hard to do. There are more variables than you, you really right. can hand on. And, and just very quickly to get back to Jim's question, the, the um, I mean, road, road waves could well be a solution to a nonlinear um, wave equation. I know very few have analytical solutions. The Courtevay de Vries equation is a is a classic one which does have solutions. And so, with the right trade off between dispersion and nonlinearity, uh, obviously you can predict and create soliton like structures. So I don't really see why one wouldn't expect rogue waves also as a possible solution under those. You know, under certain conditions. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it seems perfectly, it seems to me reasonable that rogue waves should be predictable uh, yeah. in a statistical sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, answers the question <laughs> to a certain extent. <laughs> I think uh, Aiden. Um, has a question. If I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I'm sorry. Yeah, Aiden, Aiden Schaefer. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was a really insightful presentation. Um, I'm a member of the Alternative Propulsion Engineering Conference. I've been working with uh, Mr. Sokol over the last year to um, improve Falcon Space to, uh, to a functioning laboratory. Um, we've been working on the uh, Alzafon experiment, uh, which is, you know, we're trying to generate the Larmor force and see some type of inertial mass reduction in, in materials. Um, and there was specifically in your, your presentation, you had a slide that had a bunch of like C-shaped uh, objects um, in a bunch mm -hmm. of layers. So I, could, we, could you bring that back up or highlight that point again? Because that's uh, kind of along the lines of my 3D printing materials research is, trying to figure out fr uh, fractal arrays and such, so. Um. Yes, sure. Um, I, I have a bunch of, this one, yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th this I liked because uh, when I teach about metamaterials, trying to show that extension of using naturally occurring atoms. Right. Materials to build um, 
to, to, to build composites of various kinds and, and play with their electromagnetic or, or mechanical properties. You're, you're mm -hmm. using elements from the periodic table. Here is in meta, meta material world, we can make any structure we want to have resonances that we desire and we can put them together in ways that those resonate, those re resonances couple, um, hybridize, and we've really expanded the, the, the volume uh, of possible material properties as a result. Um, but you know, the, the, it doesn't mean it's always easy to predict what those properties are gonna be. As right. you add more and more non-linearly non or strongly coupled elements together. And, and that was one reason why in one of the DARPA programs, we, we invested a lot in, teams that built simulation tools for people to use so they could get a better better handle on if they want a certain property what is the meta atom design that when patterned in a certain way or a meta molecule design mm -hmm. when built uh, building a structure from would give you the properties you want okay the uh did those tools end up in anything Avail commercially available like Comsol or um... Um, the, the the DARPA tools. Um, one one was uh, there was small companies involved. One was one's called Mirage that Sandia National Labs was the prime on, and there's a company called Stella that um, is making it available. Um, yeah. Penn State uh, also developed a, 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 a software tool. And I'm not sure if the spin-off company from them is, is, is operational yet. But if, if you want to send me an email, um, my email address, either, either of these email addresses, um, okay. that question, I, I can give you the contact information. Yeah, the, um, I'm looking into magnesium orthosilicate because uh, uh, if you look at its structure, it's you know a magnesium molecule, two oxygen, and then outside of that four silicon so that it forms a little ma bar magnet um, and then this one company uh, fortify uh, they're getting to the point where they can polarize uh, their prints as they are doing them so I'm trying to you know it, it, that tool is a quarter million dollars or <laughs> to do that type of printing just FYI and and if I'm if uh, this material does show, if we can do some more of the um, inertial weight loss uh, research with it, then that would be like my ideal material for like the whole structure or the most likely the the large the whole structure of a, a saucer shaped platform. Because that that would give you a radial, uh, it would give you coherence of your electric field and, and maybe a spin stabilization uh, down at the nuclear level. So you'd have, you'd, the idea is that that vehicle, that whole structure when charged would have uh, a lot less inertia to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, I have seen flying saucers from my time in Albuquerque and, <laughs> and, um, and I have seen optical cloaking twice, which opened up uh, Paul Murad at the Defense Intelligence Agency. But um, I know from my field observations that the propulsion field around the craft spins so um, back to the EM drive, if you're thinking in Newtonian dynamics and you're trying to create a, a box that's gonna push something out the back, that's not how they're, they're flying around. They're, yeah. they're generating a spinning field around the craft. So, but all right, thank okay. you. Yeah, okay. thank you. So I think uh, we have time maybe for one more question. Uh, Eric, uh, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. Are, are there any free electrons inside this cavity at any point in time? Are, are any electrons being ionized or um, um, do, you, do you know? That's a really great question. Um, from that one paper I cited on um, nonlinear skin effects, there, there is an expectation that there could be, but I don't know that there is I've, I don't know maybe Martin Tamar would have some idea how to observe that or Sunny if there well, is I think there could be here's what I'm here's what I'm thinking might be happening so 
you know, I, I'm a very classical physicist. You know, I, uh, uh, I think that the electron and, and the photon are both localized. But so let's say you have this free electron and then you have a photon traveling at the speed of C, um, the, the electron can absorb the photon and its, uh, it, its uh, kinetic energy will be increased. Uh, uh, its, its mass kinetic energy will, will mm -hmm. be increased, I think by half of the energy of the photon, but you also have to conserve momentum, uh, which includes the angular momentum. Uh, so this photon is gonna be absorbed. It's not gonna happen instantaneously. It's gonna take a certain amount of time for the photon to absorb. And, um, and, and because of this, uh, the angular momentum of the photon um, has, to, uh, has to transfer into the electron uh, where the overall momentum is conserved. And I think that because it takes a certain amount of time for the absorption to happen, the photon is traveling at C, but yet it's, it's eventually going to stop. And uh, there's no question about it because it's going to be absorbed in the electron. Uh, and so I think uh, the fact that the speed of light has to remain constant and there's a certain amount of time it takes to absorb the photon, I think some of the photon's angular momentum is gonna be uh, uh, converted into linear momentum and it's gonna just push off of space time itself because uh, you know space time has built in permittivity and permeability and um, it, 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 it's almost like there's just gonna be a capacitor plate there uh, just, just by virtue of having space time, having those properties. Um, I, I, I just think it's, it's something simple like that. And if there's free electrons, um, if there's no free electrons, and I don't think this concept would work, if there are free electrons, I think that might be what's happening. And I think it might not need an initial push. It just might need an, a lot longer time to get the acceleration. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing it electron by electron, uh, it, it, it might be moving uh, at, you know, picometers at first. You might have to keep it on for 24 hours before it really starts to move. That, that is something that Roger Scheuer has shared, that it, it can take a long time to get going. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying, and, and uh, um, that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. Um, we, we, I guess the question is, we, we tend to think of microwaves as non-ionizing and what the high field strengths might do in a cavity if you really get up to cues of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, um, in particular where there may be um, features in the cavity resulting from how it was fabricated. Uh, one does wonder if there if there could be um, so, generated. Yes. Yeah. One thing I um, you know I learned in working on microplasmas is that uh, from co just from cosmic rays there are is always an electrons generated in a cavity. No matter, you can't get away from them. Mm -hmm. So I know it's probably a pretty small number, but I think there is always going to be free electrons there no matter what. Good point, Charles. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks again, Mike. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the um, stimulating discussion and, and questions. Really appreciate that as well.